Good afternoon, everybody. How's everybody doing? Are y'all as excited to be here as I am? No. <laughs> hey. So, South Carolina people, are y'all all out? Let's go out of school. North Carolina people, is this your last week? So everybody will be happy by next week. Just half of you are happy this week. Yeah. Yeah, you're excited to see them come and excited to see them go. Yeah. Some people bring us joy when they come, others when they leave. All right. What time is it? Dr. Griffin Jordan's running a few minutes late. She'll be with us in a few minutes. I'll go ahead and get started. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Tonight's case study night, and I want to we'll go to our weekly schedule and look as we normally do to see where we are. So let's see. According to our weekly schedule, we're in week four now. Uh, start of week four out of ten. Uh, we've got week five, six, seven. We've got three more before our holiday break for the fourth, and then we've got Three classes after that, so we're we're on track. Uh, I'm very pleased with your evidence work. It's going really well. Uh, I do want to remind you to read the prompt on the skip. This is about communication. It's about engaging stakeholders. It's not about academics or professional development for teachers. We did that last semester. We're building a schedule and engaging our community going forward. So. On your short term goals, make sure that it's it's you're using social media or technology of some sort to better connect with your parents. And then once you've got them hooked, once you're communicating with them, we want to put on academic events at our building. Let me stop my share. The whole purpose of engaging parents in that short term is so we can get them in the building for something other than ball games. Um, I've told the story and I'll tell it again. If simply getting parents on your campus um, for whatever purpose would make your test scores go up automatically, then the highest test scores in the history of the world would have been in the 10 year period at Olympic, uh, not Olympic, I'm sorry, I was principal, at Independence High School in Charlotte. When I got to the central office and had to be in charge of such things, uh, one of the biggest tasks I had was getting enough supervision for football games on football Friday night at Independence High School. Independence went on an unprecedented run in four AA athletics in North Carolina, and they won, what, nine state titles out of 10 years, something like that. Ridiculous. They had the national media was there. They were on ESPN. Uh, providing supervision for that ball game was a nightmare because we had that, that I'm, not, I'm, I'm gonna tell you the number. I know you're not gonna believe it. There was times when we had 40,000 people at a high school football game. Let me say that again, 40,000 people. Now, if, my, if getting people on your campus would make test scores goes up, go up, those would have been the highest all time ever, but it didn't make your test scores go up. <clears throat> People attending your ball games, you step contests, is you ban, but that won't make your scores go up. The whole notion is connect with your parents, get them, get them on campus, and with the idea of help us help you help your child. Family math night, family reading night, family OC night, family OG, something where you're engaging the parents in their child's education. That's the whole purpose of the stakeholder. Uh, community involvement plan is involve the stakeholders in their child's education, not entertainment. Entertainment won't help you. Uh, so that that's the notion of the skip. If you if you keep that in your mind, it'll guide you everything. The second thing that when we get to task two, our problem there is is persons responsible. Teachers never did anything except teachers. Are going to, what teachers? I want to see names and then money, uh, fiscal means money. How much is this going to cost? Um, and task three, when you when you flesh out your marketing plan, I should see 
activities that address your short term, your long term, and your improvement of leadership. If you got any recommendations to improve that, that's the task to, task one, prompt two of, of the first task is, is what can we do to improve school leadership? And you may have some some activities in your action plan or your marketing plan in threes. And then remember when you get to task four of the skip, you write the nine competencies that you didn't write when you wrote the 12 for the OMA. Anybody have any questions on the skip? It's pretty straightforward. It is not, it's not time consuming. It is not busy. Sherry, you have something? No, I just had trouble getting my screen went went All black, right. so I was just trying to get back on. Sorry. All right. No, you're fine. You you chirped, and so I didn't know what that meant. All right. Yeah. So that's the the evidence work. We should be you should be moving into the skip pretty quickly now. Um, um, this week on intervention, we talked about intervention last week and about that. Uh, I really like the star of the week. Let's see. There she is, Alicia Graham. I really liked her. She did an excellent job. She not only talked about, I mean, she she researched that thing all the way down and, and knew fully and understood how, how it works with the bigger school and all that. And so if you want to read a really good uh, activity to read, read, read you know, there those are open to read in discussion board, but Alicia did a great job and she's the star of the week on the evidence, on the uh, the activities. Excellent job. Uh, <clears throat> all right, so tonight we're doing case study one. I want to do a quick review before we get started. Let me share my screen of the things that, that you kind of had to, I can close that one out, that you kind of had to know to help you form some of the opinions and to to answer some of the questions that we have. Um, one of the things that pops up from time to time that that people see here it is um now this really wasn't relevant to the case um that he was busy that bobby was busy with baseball but that does portend you as the leader of the school when you get to be principal or if you're the assistant principal that's in charge of athletics in a secondary school that would be middle junior high or senior high or just high anywhere between six and 12, you know that that everything, and I do mean everything, athletics is governed by the North Carolina or the South Carolina High School Athletic Association. It talks about practice time, when you practice, can't practice on work day, length of practice, can't practice more than 90 minutes, how many games you can participate. All that stuff is covered. That portends that if you're the person in charge of that, you need to make sure that you're monitoring your coaches to make sure kids aren't practicing four or five hours a day or all day on Saturday, or they're playing multiple games or they're exceeding their innings or what, whatever the case may be. Or like, you know, football coach that I inherited in high school having spring practice. Now, spring practice is fine in football if you're in South Carolina. It's not, it's not a thing in North Carolina. And so, I mean, that's the kind of stuff. Now, full disclosure, um, I was a high school coach 40 years ago, 45 years ago. I was a high school coach. Um, I tried to do the, the right thing as best that I could. But sometimes we get so competitive and we want that little bit of advantage. You know, maybe we could practice an extra half an hour or maybe, maybe we could practice on that work day or Maybe we could get the kids together in the spring and 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 just do some conditioning drills. Even when we want to take a football to the field, um, but I'm, I'm telling you, your sins will find you out. Uh, you do not want to get on the wrong side of your athletic association at the state level. Um, now you're talking about stirring parents up if you don't get to go to the playoffs or or if you know if something bad happens and, and and the school pays a penalty. It's always the kids that pay the penalty. Um, and parents do not like that, uh, and it's not the right thing to do. So make sure, as principal, that if you're not directly monitoring athletics, that you have an assistant principal that is, that knows that they're, that, that, and understands that handbook. Let me share my screen again. I had it pulled up on practice time. I was talking about everything is, is in here. This, this handbook 
Let's see. This is what it looks like. Um, and here's the staff, Q and her staff in North Carolina. And this thing is 129 pages long. And I mean, it gets down in the weeds. Uh, and you've got to understand that, that a lot of people are watching to make sure that you are keeping up with the rules. So if a kid came in and said, I'm, you know, I can't do my work because I'm practicing too much. If it's school related, then you better find out why. Now, if it's travel ball or some of these private AAU teams or some of that, you know, that, that's when you tell the parents, you know, that, that's on you. Uh, but, but you better make sure it's not on you, uh, that, that your, your coaches are following all the rules. So that's one of the things to, that, that is that to be reminded about. Grading policy, this one is nine pages long from CMS. The, the state's Board of Education in North and South Carolina set the grading policy. And then the local interprets it and has it just like, and then they have scenarios and all these things in it. And so it, this one is nine pages long, but I have one. Here is here is it simplified. This is this is what it means right here. In North and South Carolina, if your district does quarterly testing, then the, then the end of grade or end of course test counts 20%, and the quarterlies count 10. If you don't do quarterlies, then the end of grade or end of course counts 30. And it's up to districts if they want to do quarterly testing or not. Class assessment tests count 30. Class in class assignment projects count 20. Out of class assignments count 10 for the year, and homework counts 10 for the year. And so this must be communicated at least once a year at the at the opening faculty meeting that is a required work day. When the faculty handbook is covered, you have to remind them of the grading policy. So this can't be well. The principal didn't know or didn't tell, or this is this is not this case is not the principal's fault. Well, the teacher didn't know. The teacher did know. This is not a case of not knowing. Um, but you've got to understand there is state policy in terms of how the grading scale is then interpreted by the local school district. Schools do not do not determine their own grading policy. The district determines the grading policy within the parameters of what the state has set up. You have to understand that. You can't manipulate that as a principal or a teacher. You must follow the state grading and the local board grading policy. Your district will have one, just like I just showed you the one from CMS. It has nine pages so that any questions or any gray areas is covered in that nine page grading policy. There should never be an issue about grades. And as we know, uh, 115C288A is the principal grades and the person that's responsible for grading and classifying kids is the principal, not teachers. You need to remember that. Um, no tolerance. Um, putting the kid out of school without due process is a violation of federal law, state law, and local board policy. Uh, the federal law is the no tolerance expulsion, and it says clearly even if you give them an alternative, like an alternative school or summer school, it's still a, a, an illegal uh, no tolerance expulsion. That will be reported to the Office of Civil Rights. You will pay a big fine at the least, at the most, you will lose your job. Remember, you don't violate federal law, but one time. This is this is directly to the 14th Amendment equal protection under the Constitution. So even, even if an expulsion for federal person purposes is removal from a child from his or her regular school for the remainder of the year or longer, removals include both suspension and assignment to alternative schools, so it doesn't matter. You can say, well, we're going to let him go to summer school. Doesn't matter. It's still a zero tolerance expulsion, which is highly federally illegal. It also violates state law. State law says you have to give kids due process. That did not happen in this case. Bobby received the most punishment that a child can receive in public school, which is to be put out of school for a year, to have one year of their educational attainment taken away. Bobby could have brought a gun to school and not got this much punishment. You need to understand that. And you need to understand this is not a policy won't deal. This is not a teacher didn't know. This is a teacher who, you know, I've said before, you know, I'll, I'll concede Bobby's a turd and his family's a turd. You know, it's a family of turds. Uh, but you, you can't let teachers take a run at kids because they think they can. Uh, and that's, that's really the issue here. 
So I'm going to stop my share. Um, and so the group that includes Alex Birdie, I'd like for y'all to go first. So whoever's going to share your screen, go ahead and share and let's get started. Let's All right, I'll go ahead. Right. And share. Let me Must stop see. my video. It helps with the share if you're recording. Is that visible for everybody? It is. Okay. So, um, we, uh, so my name is Alex Birdie. I also worked with Dion, Michelle, Crystal, and Courtney on this. Um, I believe everybody is signed on. I think we're missing Dion here. So I'll go ahead and uh, I guess I'll talk about her slides. So the first thing that we wanted to do, and Dr. Lamb pretty much just did it, was we wanted to kind of establish the facts of the case. What are the things that are um, relevant here uh, if you were the principal in this situation? So if we look at this from the point of view of the teacher, the teacher identified Bobby's work as an exact replica uh, from an assignment, the same assignment that was administered two years earlier. Uh, the assignment in question counts for over half of the student's overall grade. And, and this is from the text itself. According to the scenario, her decision to fail Bobby was consistent with the student handbook that stated, quote, as part of the school's policy to maintain standards of personal honesty, cheating of any kind may require a, I'm sorry, I keep on having to move this uh, thing here. There we go. Uh, may require uh, any kind, may require a failing grade by the teacher. All right, uh, let me stop you right there, Alex. Yes, sir. Let me turn my camera back on. I'm sorry if you're sharing now. All right. Is it really consistent with the handbook? If I, uh, well, uh, that, that excerpt was directly from the text. Yeah, um, but, but now, but, but now, I, I, but, but it, did it, did it, is it really consistent with the handbook? It said that 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 you you know you could receive a fail you could receive a, a failing grade. Did it say that you could fail for the year? Correct. It says that you uh, could fail that assignment. Now, how do you know that's what that means? I, it didn't say you may fail the assignment. It said you may get a failing grade. How do you how do you know from the things that I covered before we started? How do you know? that you can't put in your handbook something that says if you if you do this you fail for the year because that's arbitrary and capricious well it is it's arbitrary and capricious but but what standard what federal law did i just cover that that says that you can't do that policy. you can't put a policy in that would do that the zero tolerance policy that's exactly right so when students say well she just cut, followed the the, the the grading policy no she could have gave him a failing grade on the assignment but she can't give him a failing grade for the year because that would be illegal under federal law. That's what zero tolerance means. If you do this, we give you a year out of school. There, there can be no, no, nothing in your handbook, a code of conduct for your district says, if you do this, you're out for a year. It says we can suspend you and ask for a long-term suspension and go through all the steps of due process all the way up to including the school board and a court of law. Well, now we could do that. Say, for example, if a kid brought a gun, we would give him a 10 day suspension, which is the maximum that you can suspend a kid is 10 days. And we could request a due process hearing for a for a long term suspension or exclusion for up to a year. Long term suspension could be more than the 10 days, like give him 20 or 30 or put him in an alternative school. Or we could ask that he be excluded for a year. But then there's six levels that that has to go through before that decision is made. So what we're saying, federal zero tolerance policy says you can't put a, 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 any kind of a policy in your handbook, your code of conduct that says, if a kid does this, they're automatically out for the year. So you have to, if you know that law, you know what that means is that the handbook is saying he can receive a failing grade on that homework assignment. But he can't, so it's not consistent with the law. <clears throat> so she could have given him a zero on that assignment. But then um, she manipulated the assignment to count more than half the yearly grade. That's the second violation of the law. So be clear right. in understanding that she did not follow any policy. Um, 
and, it, and, it, and their handbook did not say that you could fail a kid for the year. It said that you could give him a zero on the assignment. You could fail him for the assignment, but it did not say. Now, here's the question that I have too. If you give him on a zero on the assignment, can you then give him the one day out of school suspension, which is the maximum for cheating? Can you do both? No. No. That'd be double jeopardy, wouldn't it? That would be capricious. You'd be giving him more punishment than the law allows. So you have to pick. You either make this an academic issue and give him a zero, or you let him redo the assignment and you give him the one day suspension and, and say it's a disciplinary assignment. You got to understand, you can't do both. That'd be double jeopardy. That'd be punishing him twice for the same same incident. So if she gives him a zero, he can't be out of school. He can't be given a, a, a year long you know, failing grade for the year over that. So there's so many things to understand here in terms of how the law works. The biggie is understanding the concept of a zero tolerance expulsion. What does that look like? What does that mean? How does that work? Knowing that it's illegal. Um, and so when the handbook says he can receive a failing grade, it only means on the assignment, that's your choice as a teacher, or you can write it up as a discipline referral and he gets the one day ISS, but you can't do both. All right, I'm sorry, go right ahead. No, nope, you're good. Um, so then from the student's point of view, when confronted by the teacher, Bobby did admit to plagiarizing the assignment. Um, a failing grade will require Bobby to have to attend summer school and both student and parent signed a document indicating that they had read and underschooled the school's policy. And from the principal's point of view, the final decision regarding building grading and discipline does rest with the principal. Uh, according to the North Carolina grading policy, out-of-class assignments and projects may be counted as 10% of the final grade. I'm sorry, my daughter just walked in here. <laughs> Might be counted as 10% uh, of the final grade cumulatively. Um, so that was that. And then going into now, Due process, so due process is protected by both the 5th and the 14th Amendment. Um, most due process litigation occur, uh, the litigation concerns the 14th Amendment. Several self-incrimination issues have been raised in uh, cases for teachers being questioned by superiors regarding their activities outside of the classroom. So due process for students and teachers originates from the 5th Amendment. Uh, there are two types of due process, substantive due process, which requires the ruler policies be fair in and of themselves, and then procedural due process, which requires that policy rules and regulations are carried out fairly. At a minimum, due process should include a proper notice of the charge and a fair and impartial hearing. So using substantive due process as a guide, the cheating rule is fair in and of itself. And um, after this conversation that you just get, gave Dr. Lamb, I don't think that's true anymore. That the no, it's rule not. That's why I called on y'all first. A hundred percent. So it is, it not. is not. It is not. <laughs> no, see that that rule was manipulated into fail for the year from simply fail the assignment. So no, it's not, it's not fair in itself. Uh, what happened here is not fair in itself. Nope. And the student did not receive procedural due process in the scenario either. Correct. Um, these were all slides uh, that were made by Dion here. So I'm just trying to communicate what she was thinking when we met last night. So in substantive issues with the case, um, I'm sorry, is she on? Dion, are you on? No, that's, that's where I picked up right there with the oh, issues with the case. You. Okay, Sorry. so thank you for covering though. Um, so Bobby didn't receive a hearing, nor did he have a witness present uh, with the issue of plagiarizing. And for me, I took this back to the Fifth Amendment, granting him the opportunity to have due process and not self-incriminate himself. Um, not so much because he didn't have a witness, but because he admitted guilt and he didn't have an opportunity to have a hearing. Um, not only that, but the weight of the assignment already exceeded the guidelines set by the state and the federal laws, regardless of what the teacher knew or did not know. So those were the substantive issues. And for procedural, uh, in our group, we kind of talked about the process varying based off of school district. I know for me, we use Abe, everything goes in Abe. We, you know, if you do something, you document it. If you see something, you say something. That's the gist for us. So if students do get in trouble for plagiarizing, we give them um, an opportunity to redo the assignment, but everything has to go in as an office referral. And from mm -hmm. there, you make contact with the parent, but we do realize that that may vary based off of different schools. Yeah. So, that was okay. Was that okay? 
Yeah, I mean that's that's it. If you let them, if you let them do the, redo the assignment, then you do the office referral, and he could get up to one day of in school suspension. Or you can you can say, um, I'm going to give you that zero on this assignment, but now I can only count cumulatively every assignment that I gave uh, of this nature for the year. It goes into the you know the calculation for that final yearly grade. You know, which is 10%, all of the assignments like that. And, and we'll we'll handle it that way. We'll give you the zero, but we don't do the office referral. But you can't do both. Right. And see, even at our school, I'm not permitted to even send anyone to um, ISS. So that's something solely for the administrative staff. And honestly, for them, that's like a last result. No one really goes to ISS. If anything, um, students do get suspended or we use the bounce method where we just relocate the student within the same building. We don't even remove them from the building. So we realize that that will vary depending on schools, states and, you know, grade level and stuff like that. Um, so that was all for mine, I believe. Yeah, it was. I think uh, Dion created those questions. Yeah, so there's some concerns that the principal would need to evaluate. Uh, some of these are secondary. Um, so number one, why is the teacher using the same exact assignment from two years ago? So that is definitely an instructional concern that you would have your instructional coach address with them. Uh, so why does a project account for more than half of the student's grade? Obviously, has been stated multiple times already, it is illegal. And then why are the demands of the baseball team impeding the student's ability to complete work? And that will be, again, a secondary concern to investigate further once this situation yeah, has been you, you, know, you go to your handbook and say, all right, what, what part of this is, is not, you know, is, is not in compliance. It's exactly right. So um, why does the, the project account for more than half of the student's grade? Um, it, 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 it doesn't other than the teacher manipulated it to, to do that way, uh, but that begs the question. Um, are we are, are we allowing teachers to do different things to different kids the arbitrary part see that that that's kind of kind of the notion here um part of what makes this case kind of different is that usually it's not the well-to-do kids that we do this with what kind of kids do we normally see teachers doing this kind of thing to the kind um, of the parents won't make a big stink about it Mm -hmm. the least of us um, um that that's 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 who we usually see things like this happen to now you'll forgive me i'm an old i'm just an old fellow um and we've changed the language in modern times there's a standard in court from when my training happened years and years ago it was called a reasonable man standard that has now been updated to the reasonable person standard. Um, so let's. So even if we had no legal training and we didn't really know very much, um, just as a, a reasonable person, would it stand to reason that turning in your brother's homework assignment would cause you to fail for the year? If you didn't know anything about school, if you didn't know anything about the law, would, would it stand, would a reasonable person say, yeah, that's, that's probably okay. Would a reasonable person agree with that? Now, the reason I bring this up is, is there's going to be situations when you're a school administrator that you've got to develop a, a kind of a, a sixth sense of, that just doesn't sound right. I better go look that up. I better find out about that. That seems excessive. You know, would we, would we be able to stand the blowback if that became public knowledge? Um, you know, will that withstand scrutiny? And one of the things that a lot of folks make a calculation on is, well, these parents won't know any better. And we can go ahead and do that to these kids. And we know what code, code, the code, these kids, we know what that's code for. Um, and so <clears throat> we've got to be champions for kids, for students, uh, for all of them. 
uh, even the ones that need love most probably deserve it the least. Um, and so we we got to be champions, but but that somewhere along the line, you've got to develop this sense of yeah, that sounds right. Or oh, I don't believe that. I don't believe I don't believe we can stand that. Or, I don't think that's right. And that's part of that that developing that that it, it that that administrative mindset. How would this play if everybody knew this? If if this was on the front page of the local paper, how would this play out for us? Uh, if we were in a court of law, how would this play out? For um, those are the things you have to start. That's that that changing your lens, that administrative mindset, uh, and not digging in on the notion. Well, I got to support teachers always. I don't know where that was written. Uh, I like teachers just fine, but I don't. I didn't. I never read where in the law it said that no matter what crazy or illegal thing that they did, that you always have to support teachers. You have to dissuade yourself of that notion. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is this is this is part of that. So excellent. And again, on the baseball team part, you might want to look into what your baseball team is doing, but it, it more than likely it's going to be travel ball or some other team that's not affiliated with the school. But I would double check to make sure that if my baseball teams, if it's in season, that they're practicing the, the allotted amount of time, that they're not out there on Saturdays or on teacher work days or during the school day or, or you know, they're you know, going to the gym and practicing late or, you know, going... You know, one of the things that used to happen back in my day is, is, um, and I discontinued to practice and the parents thought I was a bad coach because I discontinued to practice. They would practice for 30 minutes there at the school and then they'd take a break and then they would just automatically, just like magic, reconvene over at the, you know, at the town's baseball field and practice under the lights at night after they'd already practiced one time that day. Well, that's against the rules, folks. Um, and then, you know, when you get caught, the parents are mad that you got caught and that you get sanctioned. Well, you're the ones who want to do this. Uh, and so I discontinued that practice immediately because as a high school coach, we were in trouble. On, you know, we were already in trouble when I took over as the head coach of the baseball team because of that kind of stuff. Uh, and then, you know, my football coach was on suspension when I became years later, when I became a high school principal after ha having served for. 15 years at various levels of principalship. Uh, I inherited a football coach on suspension because he was doing spring practice. So what I'm telling you is, is you got to keep an eye on athletics. Coaches are, are squirrely and slimy and underhanded, and I'm one of them. So I can tell you because I, <laughs> I can say that because I'm one of them or used to be. But I'm just telling you, if somebody raised a question, I'd be finding out. That's one of those things. Six cents, you better – you know, even in passing, if it was mentioned, I'd be finding out what's going on. Or I'd have somebody that knows what's going on. Excellent. Move on. Alex, you want me to jump in? I'm sorry, I was late. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so additional concerns that I did not place on the slide surround the principal and his knowledge of the situation that is occurring. So when we read the scenario, it said that he was told exactly what was happening with the teacher. And my immediate thought was, why did he push his coffee away if he was aware of what the law states? Because he would have known it was a non-issue if he was aware of the percentages that were allowed by law. So why is it that he was not able to nip that situation in the bud? Also, it just appeared to me that the majority of the people in the scenario apparently did not know the law. The teacher, for example, brought a union rep who came with her to back her up on an illegal activity. So that indicated to me that the union rep also apparently was not aware of the law. <laughs> Wait a minute, let me, let me stop you there, Dion. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you bring, if, if you've ever dealt with union reps, 95% um, of the time when you deal with union reps, their client has broken the law and they know that, but they're not there to, they're not there to get a, a equal, equitable outcome for everybody. What is their job? Their job is to represent the teacher, no matter what they did. Let me say that again, no matter what they did. And I, I can see what you're saying, Dr. Lamb. My only issue is she brought her in there as reinforcement. Well, about they do, and they'll argue about they'll, this, they'll about they'll the argue, fact. They'll argue, uh, you know, even though it's against the law and it's just plain as the nose on your face, 
they will never admit that. Their job is to be an advocate for their client against. And so now the, the funny thing is, is when you go to court with them, they disappear because they know it's not going to play in court. But now they'll 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 bluff you and bluster and bully and yell and scream and threaten court. And then when you go, they won't show up. Um, their well, job is to try thinking, to scare you. I was thinking about it in terms of the context of the scenario, though, and they specifically said when the union rep came in, she was the one that pointed out that the mother and the child had signed the right. um, student yeah. handbook. Does, so, does, but, it didn't, but they didn't sign to, to be treated, you know, for, to, to have the law violated on them. They, they're oh, just, oh, yes, that's, they're, I completely They're going to argue their, their, their side of the story. But yes, nowhere in that, you know, nowhere in that handbook did it say that we're going to send your kid home for a whole year over turning in his homework assignment. But see, or now they're, they're going to argue assignment. their perspective. And right. That, that's and, the thing that you've got to remember about them. They're not coming in to get to the bottom of things or to make things better. Their only job, no matter how crazy their teacher has been, no matter how, how bad the law is, how badly they would be, they, their job is only to support them and their side of the story. So don't don't go down that 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 path thinking, well, she didn't know, the union rep didn't know. Of course they knew. The union rep knows all these things. They're they're depending on you not to know or to pick your big enough stink and bully you, you into to, to not discipline their, their candidate, their their person, you know, their their client. Um, okay. I can see that. that. That's that's the issue with them. Remember, they're not there for the good of the group or the good of the kid. They're only there. I I I have had a, you know, an in-serve rep come in for one particular teacher that I had, and you know, I think about her often. Quite yeah, I used to be the rep, Daniel. So, I, yeah, I know that. Yeah, and so um, I think about her, and I felt like over the you know the, the course of the two years that I dealt with that teacher and that in-serve rep that she was enabling that teacher's bad behavior, self-destructive behavior. But her only, her only job was to keep us from firing the teacher um, who had a severe, and I do mean severe, drug problem. I don't mean a little bit. I'm not talking about just a little bit. I'm talking about drug dealer came and took her car. I'm talking about homeless living under a bridge. I'm talking about unbelievable. Uh, as bad an addict as you could, you know, that you could ever see. Uh, and and her only job when she showed up was to enable that teacher for us not to fire her, to keep her on, on you know, getting her check. And, you know, but she wasn't teaching. I mean, she was on, she was on leave um, and I couldn't hire anybody in her place. But I felt like that, you know, it was one of those cases where she obviously didn't have the school or the kids interest, but I don't even think she had the interest of her client at heart so now that's and, and i've had dozens of those i can tell you because i dealt with it from a district perspective um you know sometimes they're right sometimes teachers are being treated badly but it, it doesn't matter they're a paid advocate no matter what the teacher has done can't ever forget that, um, well, that they're, well, they're never going to be they're never going to be reasonable see reason or agree to anything that that is not favorable for their client so you, you got to know that when you start with them. Uh, if you do uh, then you're okay okay um i was the in-school rep but that's neither here nor there but when in my reading of the scenario it just seemed to me that a lot of people who should have been aware of this law were not right. aware Primarily, I would think the principal. Well, I, I, I don't know that the principal wasn't aware. Well, the reason, can I tell you why I said that, Dr. Lamb? Sure. In, in the scenario, they described for us how he was about to have this lovely cup of coffee that he was looking forward to having. Yeah. And when the dean came in and explained the situation, which included telling him that she was going to give him a zero for an assignment that was more than 50% of his grade. Right. His response was not, oh, that's not an issue because that's illegal. His response was, oh, dear God, let me put this coffee away. I have yes. to deal with this. So yeah. that's where I got this sense that he was not aware. And again, at the end of the scenario, they again pointed out that he reached out to the superintendent. As you would. Now, 
while I know the superintendent could not tell him the grade, nope. if he was aware of the law, why would he have to reach out to the superintendent? Because that's what you do. Oh, no, I mean, for, for guidance, if he knew that's the law- because, because again, in the law, it says that you're to do that. Oh, yes, no, no, no. What I'm saying though, the principal's knowledge of the law. The law says that he is to inform the superintendent Oh, yes. I'm saying in general, when the situation was brought to him, Dr. Lamb, when and, then, the and he got and the first thing you do is pick up the phone and call the superintendent. But wouldn't it if he was aware of the law when the guy came in, like it's a 911 emergency? No, no. no. The first thing you would do is you in a case like this where a teacher has failed a kid for the year and already assigned the, the grade. First thing you do is call the superintendent. See, I didn't get that from the scenario. It said she wanted to, and that's why she brought in her rep to back her up. Well, so what I mean. as, soon as, as soon as the rep showed up and as soon as you failed a kid for the year, it's too late to say we're going to change the grade now. That, that, that ship has sailed. Oh, this see, is that's now a legal matter, and we better, and, and when we have a legal matter where a kid gets excluded for the, has been excluded, long-term suspension or exclusion, what is the, what's the state law? Remember back to 115C288, what do you got to, what do you got to do? What's first call got to be? It's got to be the superintendent. Yeah, but that's, that's not the point I was making, Dr. Lamb. I'm not saying he should not have informed the superintendent or spoken to the superintendent. Maybe I misread the scenario, but it did no, not seem in the, to in me a case like this, that they have not, that the teacher had not given him the test. I'm sorry, the zero. What she wanted to do, she wanted to give him the zero. So that's why it was being brought to the principal's attention that if she did this. At, at that point, he, you know, his, his best course of action at that point is to call the superintendent and say, what do you want me to do? And the superintendent's going to say, you know, just use good judgment because he can't tell you what to do. It's against the law for him to tell you what to do. But he's informed the superintendent now that this is this is this is in the works and that this teacher has brought in a, a union rep and then she's, you know, you know, going to fail right, this kid for the I, year. Wouldn't I mean, the illegality there, there is, let me let me cut to the chase here. There is no culpability on the, pris the principal's part or the superintendent. They didn't do anything untoward. They followed all the things that they were supposed to do. This is a teacher issue. We're going to have one next time. It's a superintendent issue. We're going to have the last two are going to be principal issues. This one is not a principal issue. The principal did exactly what you would expect the principal to do in a case like this. They followed everything that they were supposed to do. The principal nor the superintendent bears any responsibility or culpability in this case. You got to get you got to get past that part. They should have known this or should have done that. They did exactly what they were supposed to do. This is not a principal or superintendent problem. This is a teacher going rogue, period. There is no caveat to that. This is a bad teacher who did a bad thing. Um, and well, my interpretation might have been a little different, Dr. Lamb. All right, go, Alex. Can you scroll to the next one for me? All right, zero tolerance policy. So is this, sorry, I got to move the thing out of the way. The scenario outlined that what at first seemed like a zero po tolerance policy regarding cheating at the school. However, on closer examination, the verbiage of the policy allows for the school administrator to be flexible and examine extenuating and other mitigating circumstances before deciding a student's fate, because it said the child may fail, not that the child will or must fail. So that verbiage made it not a zero tolerance. And policy. again, they, they may fail the assignment, not for the year. You yes, can put that a policy in that says they can fail for the year. Now, make sure that, you, that you're clear in that, yes, we can determine whether that kid gets a zero on that on that assignment, but we can't have a policy that says if you if you if you cheat on an assignment, it wouldn't fail you for the year. That would violate, violate federal zero tolerance, tolerance policy. Um, but again, we, we must look at this from the perspective of understanding that when it says may receive a failing grade, you have to understand the implied part of that is on the assignment. That's part right. of she administrative was, knowledge. Right. I assume that because that's what she wanted to give him for that one assignment that was illegally being grade. And then than it, 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 it wouldn't have been illegal for her to give him a zero on the assignment. The illegal part was making 
that one assignment account more than half the yearly grade. That was the illegal part. Yeah, that's what I was saying. That that's where she went wrong was um, making that amount the amount. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. That was again, she could give him a zero, or she could let him redo the assignment and make it a discipline referral and get one day of in school suspension. She could choose to do one or the other. But you can't give him the zero and say, oh, by the way, that assignment counts more than half your yearly grade. You fail for the year Get, you know, with, with no due process, either substantive or procedural, you know, violating federal law, violating the state grading policy, violating the district policy. So I'm talking about this. This hinges on that one thing that she decided, um, which violated several, several things. Well, I don't know. Maybe it's because when I read the scenario, I realized, honestly, I've, I taught for how many years and I was not aware of this law. And I've brought this to my principal's attention and they've not been aware of this law. So I guess when I read it, I was thinking about real life. And if as a teacher myself, not being aware, how Your do I know that? Is that not teacher... aware of zero tolerance policies? No, about the grading policy. I've never heard of that in all the years that I've taught in Guilford County Schools. Doing this is what has introduced that to me. Y'all don't have one that looks like the one I showed you from CMS? I've never seen that ever. And I've taught for 16 years. You've never so, seen the, the district's grading policy? Not the one. I know that they can only do 25% for EOCs. That one I know is part mm -hmm. of the law. But that's the only one that I'm aware of where there was a set amount. Your, your school started. handbook doesn't have the grading policy in it? It's going to, well, I put one in there. And fortunately for me, it matches up with what you showed us for the state. But I just did that off of common sense that it made okay. sense to me 30% yeah. for a test, blah, blah, blah. But realistically, no. Um, and a few other people have mentioned that they've never heard of it either. So that's why I was thinking with the teacher, where did she get the information that this was what the law said? Well, again, requirement is, is at the beginning teacher work day that you cover the faculty handbook and in that has to be the district's grading policy. That's been standard since I was ever in the business 40 years. Um, I never worked in Guilford. I've done a lot of interns there. I've got the, I've got the, uh, what is it I've got? I've got their grading policy, the one, and I've got their, their scheduling uh, non-negotiables from Guilford County. Now, I only ever worked in Wake, um, Charlotte, Burke, and Rutherford, two, two rural, low wealth, two urban high wealth districts. Uh, never worked in Guilford, but in both Wake and, and CMS, uh, we had, we had to, as principals, we had to go over the grading policy. And I, as I said last week, I did it twice a year in Charlotte because we had such faculty turnover. Uh, we went over it twice a year. We went over the grading policy. Um, high school. Well, we're going to be doing it now. I spoke that's, to my principal. That's a good thing. That's, we, that's, even that's though it's right. in there. We are going to actually be doing it. And if you could be so kind, can you share that Guilford County stuff so I can share it with my principal as well? I meant to ask you that. But go on, Alex, we can move to the next one. All right. So moving on to the four paradigms of ethics, the first one is justice. Um, and this talks about the fairness and equity and justice. Um, standard reasonable suspicion versus probable cause, arbitrary and capricious, corporal punishment is legal, um, the Jim Crow law with segregation and that metal detectors are legal. And thinking about this case study, um, it does appear that the teacher wanted the student to seek punishment for turning in his brother's assignment. Um, when I was reading this over and when we were discussing this with um, our group last night, we did talk about would she treat all students this way or was she targeting um, Bobby in this scenario? All right, so why have I got Jim Crow there? What does Jim Crow mean? Well, it was part of what the parad the four paradigms. Um, yeah, it but does what does that mean? It talks about the um, segregation. And well, it's not really segregation. It's discrimination based on your social class, isn't it? Or your race. Yes. And it goes to the point that you're just making. Uh, yes. Usually so we do these kinds of things to kids because of their social class or their race. Um, and so that's what Jim Crow means. It's, it means 
it's not a written rule or law, uh, but it's standard practice of how we discriminate against certain groups in, in society. That's what Jim Crow means. And that's why I said earlier that the, the anomaly in this case is, is generally it's not our well-to-do kids that we treat this way, but this is standard practice on certain certain groups of kids and we know which ones they are. So that's that's the notion of justice here is that we treat poor kids differently or poorer than we do the well-to-do kids. That's what that that's what it, you. you so yes, it, it violates that Jim Crow standard of justice. Is is you know this this poor kid? You know this is a, a a child of color, BIPOC. So we can treat them any way we want to. That's just how we work, roll around here. That's that's right. what we're talking about. Now, yeah. explain to me. Didn't, didn't explain specifically to, say that, but yeah. that's you know definitely something that was taken. Yeah, that's into what I mean. When when you're looking at justice, we have to take that into consideration. Mm -hmm. Explain to me arbitrary and capricious. All right. So thinking about the consequences that um, the teacher was giving Bobby for failing the class, we've mentioned that several times since we've started. Um, being able to say this one assignment counts for 50% of your grade and you are going to fail the class because you plagiarized in this assignment is arbitrary and capricious. The punishment does not fit the crime. Um, the teacher decided to go against the grading policy and since this appears to be Bobby's first offense of plagiarism, the consequence should not have been so severe. Right. Well, arbitrary again, let's make sure we understand the two standards. Arbitrary is when we don't we don't enforce whatever code of conduct that we have, that we don't enforce it evenly. That again, it goes back to certain kids we we throw the book at them and others we don't. Uh, and then capricious is we give more punishment than the law allows. Um, and again, that goes back to that justice in, in that arbitrary. Do we treat everybody the same? Or do we discipline kids based on their social class or their skin color? All right, continue on. All right, so thinking about the care, the loyalty and trust, concern and connection, um, thinking about the teacher didn't show care for Bobby and the rest of the students in the class with having an out of class assignment counting for over 50% of their grade. Um, the teacher more, seemed more concerned with Bobby failing her class than how to help Bobby understand the importance of turning in his work. Um, also caring about the relationship that um, and the connection that she has that she could have been more nurturing toward Bobby since he felt overwhelmed with life balancing schoolwork and baseball that he felt like copying his brother's assignment was the answer to this. Um, the principal seemed more concerned about the student's ability to participate in sports than the teacher's actions of her grading policy. Um, so having that shared decision making, um, knowing making sure that the teacher knew what was the grading policy, um, paying attention and support to the, the students and making sure that the policies that the teachers were enforcing were um, having the, best, the students' best interests at heart. Um, and I did the third paradigm in the fourth paradigm, critique and profession. So with critique, um, I focused on corrupted morals, power, and social class. Um, with the corrupted morals, I felt like um, morals were um, questioned for all three parties involved. Um, Bobby, of course, for cheating or plagiarizing his assignment. All, although he admitted to cheating and using his brother's paper, it's clear that he understood that what he was doing was wrong and it was unacceptable behavior. Um, I think that the principal's morals were in question because he was not, a, I'm going to say that he was not aware or he did not do anything about um, the teacher's disregard for the policies, the state law, I should have said state law instead of policies and procedures, but, um, and he allowed her to um, assess or provide an assessment score of 50% or more for one assignment, and it was an out of class assignment. So um, his morals were a little in question um, at that point. And then with the teacher, that goes back to what Michelle was saying. She failed to teach the whole student. 
he was struggling trying to balance academics and athletics and instead of kind of having a little bit of empathy for him um she wanted to throw the book at him so that's where I went with the morals corrupted morals and how I felt like all three um of the morals were questioned for the principal the teacher as well as Bobby um of course we know that the principal has the power he is the chief executive officer the final decision regarding Bobby's fate does lie with him um, for his unethical behavior. Um, it is also the job of the principal to ensure that the teachers are following state laws as it pertains to grading. Now, with the teacher, she also tried to exercise some power by, like in, in the words of Dr. Lamb, going rogue, um, just doing what she wanted to do because she thought that she could do it. Um, she's trying to exercise her power by creating an assignment that goes against the state's grading policy. Um, she is attempting to use his power. Um, she has to recommend that Bobby fails his assignment due to his admission of guilt for plagiarizing. Um, and with social class, I personally, when I read it, I did not see that the teacher was being, was using Bobby's social class. Either she did not know who Bobby's uncle was and how instrumental he was to the district um, or the community or she just didn't care. And maybe she used the fact that he was so big to, you know. There um, you go. You, you, you've come around to the right answer there. Okay. Um, this, this case is a little different in that rather than discriminating or treating the lower level kids poorly, this is a case where you had a kid whose family is basically untouchable and she, she, did this, she just did the reverse of what you normally do, but she took it out on this kid because his family is powerful and then called her union rep in to, to, to back her up. Um, but either way, it's not a good thing. Either way, it's illegal. Either way you go, whether she took a swipe at him because, you know, because she thought she could get away with some poor kid or a well-to-do kid because she, you know, the family is pain in the behind. Um, but either way, that door swings either way you know, the corrupted morals when you're doing critique. I mean, she took a swing at him because of his family. In this case, it just happened to be they were upper rather than lower. Uh, but it's 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 the same thing. Yes, sir. Um, but the um, the dean as well as the superintendent, although they couldn't, um, you know, tell the principal what to do, they made sure he understood who the uncle was prior yeah. to him. Yeah. Um, yeah. Prior to him deciding upon, you know, a consequence for Bobby. Yeah. Um, and then profession. Um, all parties should be held accountable. There should be accountability placed upon all parties. Bobby, yes, he did. He cheated. He plagiarized. He understood that he did that and he under, apparently he understands that there has to be a consequence. Um, I think that we should hold the principal himself accountable no, because- No, I'm going, I'm going to say again, that's a teacher's perspective. The principal has zero culpability in this case. You can't keep your teachers from doing crazy stuff. That's an unrealistic ex expectation of school principals that, 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 that you can, that they can keep their teachers from doing illegal or unethical or immoral things. That now, if 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 we knew that he had done she had done this before and he didn't do anything about it, then he would have plenty of culpability. Just like when we talk about reporting sexual stuff, if there's been reports and you haven't investigated or you told them to quit it or put a notice up in the lounge or whatever. But I'm gonna say again, you can't hold principals accountable for crazy things that their teachers do. Uh, that's, but I guess that's I was an unrealistic thinking expectation. I'm going to say it again. The principal has zero culpability in this case. None. None. Zero. Didn't do anything wrong. Followed all the proper steps and procedures. The superintendent did the right thing in reminding him this is a sensitive case. You need to deal with this. You've told me now you need to handle this. Uh, he, he did exactly as he was required to do by law. He reported it to the superintendent that the teacher went rogue, he cannot be blamed or held accountable that a teacher went rogue. They do it all the time, unfortunately. Unfortunately, they do it all the I never got through a year as a principal that I didn't have one teacher that just went just 
you know, bat crazy on me, you know, did something crazy. You, you never have a year. If you're a principal, especially at larger schools where you might have, like me, I had 212 faculty members at, at a high school. Just do the math on, on a normal distribution. 212 people, one of them is going to do something crazy during the year. You just hope it ain't eight or ten of them. Uh, but you cannot hold the principal accountable for a teacher doing something like this. That's an unrealistic expectation. When you are in the role, you're going to understand that you do the best you can and you, you try to facilitate your teachers and you try to nurture them. You try to do the best that you can by them. But that doesn't mean that they're always going to reciprocate with their behavior. Um, if you, that's an unrealistic expectation that they're all going to be perfect all year long. And it's unrealistic that we're going to hold principals accountable when their teachers do bad things. We, we can't be in that business. Uh, we'll, we'll never get any principals and we, we, we won't be able to have anybody in, in, the, in the, nobody will ever want to sit in the principal's office if we hold them accountable for other people's behaviors. Um, because everybody's adults. We, we don't hire kids. This is grown people business. Um, and they make choices sometimes that are not the best. Uh, you, may, you may get that call on Monday morning about 10 o'clock from the drunk tank over to Mecklenburg County Jail. And one of your teachers is in the drunk tank because he had too much weekend over to the Panthers football game. Now, I don't drink, so I can't be held accountable that Frank was a drunk. Uh, now, I can be held accountable what I did after that. Uh, but, but until, you know, the first time, you know, that was within the first month of school. Uh, I, I didn't know Frank was a drunk or alcoholic, I guess is a more important uh, or more appropriate term. I can't be held accountable for his alcoholism until I find out. Now, after that, I took the appropriate steps and eventually Frank couldn't work there anymore. But now, until I know that, until that happens, I can't be held accountable for things that might happen. I'm going to be held accountable for things that, that I don't deal with. So again, for the 17th time, this is not a principal problem case study. Principal nor the, nor the superintendent have any culpability in this case, zero. Um, so we have to get out of that teacher mindset that it's somebody else's problem, or somebody else's fault, or so there's blame to go. No, nope, there's not blame to go around everywhere. Here. This is a teacher problem. That's what this case study is about. This is a teacher problem. I, I do understand. Um, I guess I was um, thinking, I guess thinking about maybe he didn't know, but I guess that was just an assumption. So maybe he didn't know. So um, of course the teacher needs to be held accountable for her actions because um, she is not, she's not following the state grading scale. That is correct. Um, so she definitely, definitely should be held accountable for her actions. Um, with principals, it, I'm pretty sure that, well, I know for a fact that Bobby is aware of his wrongdoing, mm -hmm. um, but I question the teacher's self-awareness um, because of, if we go back to um, the critique part in the social class, I'm pretty sure she's aware that she's doing something wrong, but is she aware that she could possibly be hurting um, other chances for Bobby when it comes to not only academics, but athletics? I think that um, was the point. I mean, I, I, yeah. I, I think she not only knew that and was hoping to leverage that. I mean, she's taking, she's taking a big cut at Bobby here. Remember, and I'm going to say this again. This is the most punishment that you could give. This is the worst thing you could do to a kid outside of other than physically or sexually abusing the child. This is the worst thing that you could do, taking a year of their life away. Uh, and she fully knew that that's what she was doing to manipulate the grading scale. So did she not know? Well, of course she knew. That was the whole point. Uh, she intended to bruise Bobby for life. That, that, that's, that's the notion here. Uh, I, I, you know, she took her shot. She wasn't going to take a little. I mean, she, she's 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 aiming to 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 ruin Bobby's life the best she can for as long as she can. I mean, this is a big deal. This is a big deal. You know, she's taking. You know, she, she this is a big shot. This this is not just you know, she she's pulled out the big guns here on this. One. Yeah. Um. Of course, there's unethical behavior on the part of Bobby and the teacher. Um. 
And with transparency, where I went with transparency, there is a lack of transparency. And um, the teacher, just like you said, going rogue. Um, is this something that she has been doing for years? Do the students know that this is the, you know, is she transparent? Apparently she's not, there is no transparency in her grading scale um, because she is not using or she's not consistent with the district or the state. Um, so that's where I thought the lack of transparency was with her um, inability to mirror what the state is doing. Um, values, I think values are misplaced here, especially with the teacher, um, because she doesn't seem to value Bobby as a student. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, so, and with Bobby, I just think that his values are misplaced because he did use his brother's work and he's putting, it's, it seems like to me, he's putting baseball before academics. Um, I put the principal in there, but after hearing, um, you know, after hearing you speak, Dr. Lamb, I think that the principal could definitely come out um, because he value, I, I could tell that he values his students and he wants to do what's right, which is why he followed um, the law in talking to the superintendent, talking to the dean and trying to make sure that he goes about things the correct way. Um, moral and legal consequence of decision-making, I think that was solely in the grading policy with the teacher. And I don't think that the teacher was thinking about what was in the best interest of Bobby and, and the school, because not only did she put Bobby in um, a bad predicament, she also placed the school in one as well by you know not adhering to the grading policy law. All right. So what is the what do we think the principal should do in this situation? So definitely regarding the incident itself. So that assignment, uh, the weight of the assignment needs to be adjusted to be in line with uh, state and federal laws going from counting as 50 percent of an overall grade to 10 percent because it is an out of class uh, assignment or project uh, regarding the teacher. You know what? We just I don't know if we really had enough information to make a decision between termination or an action plan. Um, so investigate it further. You know, I would say review the teacher's previous grade books, see if this has happened before. Um, how far does the problem really go? Is this a problem amongst the whole staff where uh, they are not in alignment with the grading policies? So uh, I would definitely say to we, we need to get more information um, to see just how far it goes. If this is a repeated behavior, I would say to go ahead with termination because it's it's definitely uh, uh, a, a pattern. Um, if not, uh, we would have to put this teacher on an ask, uh, action plan. Um, so regarding the student, there were really two options that we had. We could either discipline the student appropriately according to district guidelines, or we could allow the kid to, to redo the assignment and get an appropriate grade for that. Um, we were of the mindset to allow the kid to redo the assignment um, so that way he can get his education at the same time. And then on the part of the principal being just reflective, not saying he has any culpability, but just being reflective, how, what are some things that they can be uh, implemented to try to prevent something like this from happening again? So I would say to implement uh, grade book checks uh, periodically throughout the school year where you would have somebody ensure that their grades and weights are in line. Um, have a PD at the beginning of the year on proper grade book setup, and then make sure that you are adding the state laws and federal laws uh, about the grading weights to the faculty and parent student handbooks as well that puts an emphasis uh, to make sure it's in alignment with state law. All right. And then this last one. Is that you, Courtney? Uh, yeah, so, well, well, yes and no. So for the principal action, um, of course, we already stated that the principal is responsible for students' grades. That was something um, that I needed to realize, I think, this school year, especially especially after hearing people in my hallway getting frustrated about having shortages and stuff with 
teachers and having to put grades in and people feeling like they could question certain things. So I definitely needed to know that. Um, but one of the one of the two options was to to conduct an investigation um, based on the results of the investigation, place the teacher on the action plan, or either write the teacher up um, or to fire the teacher immediately for not following both the state and federal laws, or the principal could familiarize himself with the grading policy, which we know that's not the case because the principal is aware this is all about the teacher. So making sure that the teacher is held accountable for her actions and making sure that other teachers don't follow suit to what she has done and we probably need to go back and look at the grades for the other students too because this one might have just been a red flag because she remembered the assignment but other students are subjected to the same grading policy good idea uh, that's, all we, that's all we got here all right the others will go faster i see our resident you can stop your share now I see our resident expert has gotten here. We're going to go to her for her thoughts on this case. And again, she's going to tell us what she would do if this were her teacher. So Dr. Griffin Jordan, welcome and thank you for being with us this evening. So give us your thoughts on this case. Hello, everybody. I apologize for being late. Um, this case has a lot of different angles. Um, I think I picked up on a lot of uh, toward the end what you all were saying, for instance, the ethical behavior. Um, that is something that we're looking at, not only with the teacher, but with the student. But as professionals, we're our job is to teach students behavior and how to be fair and equitable. So we have to practice that. So our teachers must do their job and practice ethical behavior, whether it's in assigning uh, points or taking away points or grading all that has to be considered. Um, we talked about the principal a little bit and uh, let's see, Alexander mentioned the grading policy and you know, is this, this a problem with the whole staff? If it is, then that does kind of fall back on the principal. What has been put in place? Does your staff know the grading policy at the beginning of the year? And then I believe in uh, one of our other sessions, Dr. Lamb mentioned he does it more than once a year because you're yes. always getting new. Yes, you're always getting new people in. So um, that's actually something that I'm going to implement. That was a very good idea. I always do it at the beginning of the year, but midway in January, when you come back from that long, long winter break, just in case somebody forgets it or in case you have someone new, just have that first faculty meeting and just do a little rehash on everything. Make sure your teachers know the grading policy. Um, this year, at the end of the year, uh, my staff got together and I let them go at it. They, I, The administration left them. They talked about the current grading policy because um, some people were doing, you know, kind of straying a little bit. So before it got really out of hand, I was like, hey, you all talk, come up with some ideas. What, do you, what can you all develop as a consensus? As long as it works and as long as it's benefiting the students, I can support it, but whatever you all come up with, I'm going to hold the staff accountable. So if they're coming up with that grading policy and I can assure that it's meeting um, equitable standards and it's ethical and you know the guidelines from the state and the district, I'm okay with it, but they've decided. So everything that comes from that grading policy, I'm gonna hold them 100% accountable to follow it. Um, transparency. Again, as a, as a school leader, make sure you are transparent. Make sure your teachers know that you're there, as the, should they be there, for the students. And whatever's in the best interest of the student is what you're going to do. My teachers know I support them. I really do. I have their back. But they know that it's as long as it is in the best interest of the student. If something happens and it's not in the best interest of the student and they've done something unethical, they know, I'm not going to support that. I'm going to support the right thing that's in the best interest of the student. So it's no gray area um, with that. They 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 know I have their back as long as they're doing the right thing. Um, and then uh, Courtney mentioned principals assign grades. Um, that is something that I learned when I became a principal. Um, I didn't know that before. I thought the teacher assigns grades, but no, just like 
HR does, I mean, excuse me, the Board of Education does the hiring, not the principal. The principal assigns grades, not the teacher. The teacher submits grades. The principals have to sign off on the grades. So you just have to make sure, um, and it was mentioned also in this, the last uh, part of the group that you may want to go back through and make sure all of the, the grades are fair and accurate. This might've just been that one red flag, but there may be others. So that's a task that you as the principal, now you have to go back and just make sure everything is accurate. But as far as the principal, um, yes, definitely. If she knew better, then that's grounds for termination. If she's acting like she didn't and possibly you didn't make the grading policy, you know, 100% you know, like like they they know it and you haven't gone over, then that's an action plan in, in my book. All right. Yeah. All right. So the last thing, and then we're gonna get, we'll go faster with the next groups is I was a high school principal and we had some AP classes. Um, and then two years into my tenure at that school, we became an AP high school, which is a little different, uh, which meant that we offered the AP diploma. If you had enough, if you had enough of these classes, you could get an AP diploma, advanced placement diploma. Um, and that was a big deal. Um, we had to go to the, the national AP deal training. And we went out to Texas in July. That's how smart we were. Uh, it was only nuclear hot. And we went over into New Mexico and into oh, and actual Mexico. But anyway, but the point of the story is, you say, well, how hard, why would you need two weeks or a week of training? Well, about grading, because all of a sudden it, 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 it got real on the grading in terms of uh, it was about college scholarships. It was about uh, it was about college acceptance. It was about grade point average. It was about valedictorian and salutatory and all those kinds of things. And AP is rather involved in terms of it, when you talk about an AP diploma. Now, if you just offer AP classes, it's not that big a deal. But when you start offering an AP diploma, people are up, you know, they, they, you, you, you don't even, you, know, you, you think you're in a room by yourself, you turn around, and there's a dozen people watching everything you do. Um, grading becomes a big deal. Um, and so you better know that, that even in elementary schools, parents are watching, they're comparing. Um, you better have all your teachers on board. You need to do good staff development with them. You need to make sure. Um, again, I, I learned the hard way to go over grading twice a year uh, when we became an AP diploma granting high school because I had people in my office every day about the grading system and about the grades and the GPAs and the quality points. It was an everyday thing. It drove me crazy. Um, the first two years, you know, I, I didn't even know there was such a thing. But then after that, you better believe I knew it was such a thing. Um, I mean, there's going to be other people other than you involved in this. So you, you better know what's going on in your building. I can tell you that right now because it matters to some people and it matters a lot. All right, we'll go to we'll go to our next group. Um, let's see, uh, Stephanie, your group. So a couple of my uh, team members are having some issues. I don't know if Stephanie okay. can speak or not. I'm going to send her a text. Are you, you can, was that you, Stephanie? No, that's me. Larissa. Okay, there's Arissa. Let me go ahead and get started. Go ahead. Okay. All right, Daniel, so go ahead to the next slide. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's just a little title. Next slide, please. Yep. There you go. 
All right, so um, some key points to me were some things that the teacher almost like just constantly said to the principal, um, just kind of ramming in his head that, you know, there is a policy in the, in the handbook that says that cheating of any kind may require a failing grade by the teacher. So she reminded him of that. Um, she also informed him that she expected him to uphold the school's ban on cheating. And then she also let him know that um, she reminded him that Tim, I'm sorry, that Bobby, his mom, had signed a letter indicating awareness of the contents of the handbook. And so those were just key points for me for the teacher's aspect, because um, I think like in the role of a teacher, you do think that way. And so um, sometimes it's not always fair the way that you're thinking. Um, but in this case, it's illegal as well. Right. We've already, we've already talked about that first point. Yes. Federal right. law says you can't you can't make a, a grade that would fail a kid for the year. It could only be the assignment. Right. Uh, and so, All right. Next one. But you're right. Teachers teachers think that how dare they cheat, and they they would argue that he ought to be ought to be able to fail him for the year over cheating on an assignment. You're right. And that's what teachers I'm saying. I know that because I've that. had several colleagues, you know, that to feel that way. Daniel, what you doing, buddy? <laughs> All right. Um. So. Here are some action steps that I thought that um, Tim should take. And so one um, would be consult with the teacher, which he did that. Um, Dr. Lamb, I didn't know for sure if he should consult with the parents after the teacher um, or the superintendent. So I said reach out to the parents. Well, the law says he's supposed to call the superintendent. Got you. Now, okay. remember, this kid, this effectively would you know, exclude this kid. Now, I, I don't ever use the word expel. Mm -hmm. uh, expel means you can't ever come back. You mm -hmm. know that no matter what a kid does in public school, there is no expulsion. There's only exclusion. After mm -hmm. 365 days, they can apply to come back. Mm -hmm. So, but what the law says is certain acts have to be reported to the superintendent. When you are talking about excluding a kid for a year, which is failing a kid for the year, you have to call the superintendent. So that's why I mean, the. the the principal didn't do that because he was a nitwit. He did mm -hmm. that because that's the legal requirement that he has to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then and, 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 uh, and, and acknowledge to the superintendent that this is what's going on at my school or mm -hmm. our school. And, you know, and the superintendent says, be careful now. But he doesn't tell him what to do or not to do because right. legally he can't. The, right. the, 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 the two legal responsibilities there are principal must call the superintendent and the superintendent must not tell the principal what to do because it's a great issue. Um, okay. They're very, they, they're very, you know, they followed their roles perfectly in terms of what they had to do by law. Um, and that, that's, that's the thing you have to understand here. This wasn't a principal panicked or not knowing what to do. He simply mm -hmm. followed through on his legal responsibility. The superintendent wasn't telling, you know, speaking out of turn about politics or, or any of that, the superintendent, you know, said, I acknowledge that you've called. I've got it. Mm -hmm. I know what's going on now. And just let me tell you, you know, follow through and make sure that, you know, you do the right thing here. Now, he didn't tell him what the right thing was because legally he can't, but he mm -hmm. said, you need to follow this thing through. But again, we've got to remember that the teacher is going to argue their point, but their point has no, no basis in court. The, the union rep is going to argue the teacher's point, even though, again, it has no basis in court. Uh, mm -hmm. but, they're going to, but you're not ever going to convince them to see it your way. That's one mm -hmm. of the reasons, you know, that, that's one of the things here is, is that we have this mistaken assumption that when we, when people know better, they'll do better. That's mm -hmm. not true. Can't make that assumption that because they know that this was wrong and illegal, that they'll, oh, I shouldn't have done. No, they'll double down even harder. Um, and then they'll tell everybody that listens that you that, that principal doesn't support teachers. They'll tell everybody. They'll be like they'll be everybody in, everybody in the parking lot at Walmart will know that weekend. They'll tell everybody that they can, that they come across what a dirty dog the principal is for not supporting them. Okay. And they won't tell the part where they violated federal, state law, and local board policy. They won't tell that part and that they tried to put a kid out for a whole year for turning in his brother's homework assignment. They won't tell that part. Um, they'll just tell that, that the piece that you want. But again, that's some, one of those times when you just have to take your whipping as a school administrator. You just have okay. to bow your neck and just keep going. Okay. Um, um, thank you for that. I said at some point he needs to talk to the baseball coach and then also just kind of really look at the um, policy. Like, was it really clear um, as it was stated? 
Now, I, 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 I want to be clear here about the baseball, and that's why I brought up the, the handbook and showed you okay. the high school athletic handbook. You don't need to make Unicorn. the baseball coach a part of your investigation or a part of okay. this case. You do that on the on, on the QT, on the side. You okay. can find out yourself or your AP that's in charge of athletics. You find out what's going on. But now you don't want to drink the, the baseball coach in this. Okay. You don't, you don't want to get in, involved in that again. They, you know, we, we want to handle that as a separate issue. Okay. Uh, nobody has okay. come in and reported that they're practicing out of, you know, that they're practicing right. out of season or seven hours or any of that. We do not want to make an accusation against the baseball okay. coach. That would be, uh, that would not be the right thing to do against them. We're going to investigate that piece and mm -hmm. we're going to make mm -hmm. sure that we're following the high school athletic handbook on what they're mm -hmm. doing or not doing. But we're not, we're, you know, nobody has made an accusation against the baseball yeah, coach. The baseball coach. We're okay. Real careful about that. Okay. We don't want to violate their rights either. Okay. Um, I mean, you know, as bad as coaches sometimes behave, they have rights as well. You got to remember okay. that. All right. Thank you. All right, next slide, please, Daniel. The next one was just about like the whole due process and how um, I didn't see anywhere that there was due process um, that, that had taken place within this um, incident. And next slide. So some options that the principal may have in this case study, um, he could support the teacher and reinforce the policy. He could possibly um, suggest that Bobby repeat the course with another teacher, or he could suggest that Bobby attend in summer school. The thing about it, though, is that he's got to make a really clear choice about what's going to happen because he has he staff. Really, can he mm -hmm. really make any of these choices on the screen and follow the law? No, I, those are options. That's what I mean, but these aren't really options. I mean, he could break oh, the law okay. and, do, and do all of them, but you know, he doesn't, these are not options under the law. Okay. That's what you got to understand is, is again, remember when you were a kid and your mama said if your friend jumped off the building, would you jump off with them? Um, mm -hmm. The teacher broke the law here. If he, if, if the principal does any, if Tim does any of these three things, he's broken the law as well. Okay. I understand now. I do. Thank you for that. All right, Daniel. Okay, so we also looked at the four paradigms of ethics with justice. Um, uh, with justice, the principal must keep in mind that these rules must be uniform. Um, when it comes to plagiarism, we need to make sure that all the teachers and administration are ensuring that all students are partaking in the act, um, that they do receive a failing grade, and it's not, you know, and also make sure that the school's policy is following uh, law, that the project is not weighted more than what it actually should be. Um, and justice as well, that the principal is acknowledging that the academic policy is speaking with the teacher and the student. Um, and we also said that Bobby should be able to challenge the consequences brought against him and participate in some sort of due process. And if um, the principal didn't think it was appropriate, he'd be involved that there'd be some sort of other hearing officer, just especially because we know that Bobby's uncle is invested in the school and the district. So it might I don't know if it's a conflict of interest or if it's just something where you maybe need, need a neutral party to be involved in that. Uh, we also looked at what's ar arbitrary and capricious. Um, is Jane following the school policies for plagiarism? Even if she is following with them, is she grading with fidelity um, for everybody? Um, is, and also, it doesn't sound like the school's policy for grading is even aligned with the law, so that needs to be corrected too. And we also, as an administrator, Tim needs to ensure that his actions are based on data and he's following law. And then care. So loyalty and trust, concern and connection, relationships, collaboration, shared decision-making connections. Um, the, the teachers trust and the principal uphold the policy and respect her decision to give Bobby the failing grade. Um, and she brought up that the signed acknowledgement of the handbook. Um, we have the concerns, the principal has concerns that the consequences of failing Bobby can have a negative impact on the relationship built with Mr. Michaels. Um, and the, the principal took precaution by informing the superintendent that <clears throat> who gave him his support, informed him that he has to make the, it was taking into consideration the biggest voice and stakeholder, Mr. Michaels. 
And I, I, I don't know, Dr. Lamb, isn't because Mr. Michaels is on the school board, is the superintendent supposed to interface with the board members rather than, rather than the school principal? Um, this kind of goes back to your previous slide. In a case like this, where you would recommend that a kid be out for more than the 10 day, short term suspensions can go up to 10 days. Anything that, that's more than 10 days, there has to be a, a hearing by the superintendent or their designee. Um, some districts have hearing officers that do the, that, but they, they're an impartial person that comes in and you have to submit your case. And then when the actual hearing occurs, the school has to present the case to begin with. They have to make their case. Uh, it's just like in the court of law. Prosecution has to go first and, and build their case and then the, the other side responds in, in, in kind to that case. In, in, a, in a situation like this, the superintendent and the board members would not talk about something like this um, because it's outside of the scope. Now, eventually, if, if, this, if, this, if this expulsion or excuse me, if this exclusion is upheld through the school level, uh, the superintendent level, and then when it gets to the board, you have to go to the board and explain it to them because a three person committee of the board would hear the case. And if they decided that they would uphold this, this, this exclusion for a year, it would then go to civil court. Um, and then it would have to be upheld there for it to actually happen. That's why I said there's six levels that this would have to go through. Now, the thing about it is, is somebody who was the person who did this in the largest district in the state. Uh, I was the deputy. I did do this. Uh, I can tell you right now, this one would never got past the school level. Because the first thing when, when the school has to submit all their paperwork and all their evidence, first thing that, that, that the person acting as the assistant superintendent or the hearing officer that gets this first thing you'd have to, that you would know immediately is, is they have no legal grounds to do this, this kid, that this does not follow the, the, the district or the state grading scale. Um, even, even if they'd gone due process with this kid, it would have not got past the school level, uh, would not have been upheld at all because you, you have to, it has to be based on a rule in your handbook or a, 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 a rule of law when this comes back. Um, the only rule of law on this one is, is that he violated cheating. Well, it says he can have one day ISS and you're asking to exclude him for a year when the handbook says one day ISS. Oh no. And you violated the state grading policy. That's what that person is expert in. I've done that. I did that. I know. Um, you have to be expert in knowing what law specifically did this kid break or policy that you're asking for more than a 10 day suspension out of school. Um, and that's why I mean, you understand when you process discipline as an assistant principal that your decision can be appealed to the principal. And then the principal's decision can be appealed to the superintendent's designate. And then their decision can be appealed to the superintendent and the superintendent's decision can be appealed to the Board of Education and the Board of Education's decision can appealed to civil court in the county which the school resides. Six levels. Six. That's due process. So everybody has a role all along the way and it goes back to what rule, policy or law did the kid violate? Uh, is what the kid being charged with the crime or the policy that they're being charged with is it legitimate is it, it does it clearly state in the handbook that you can't do that so if you do you get this and again there can be no rule in or, or policy in your in your code of conduct or handbook that says that that if you cheat you get put out for a whole year it can't say that because that would be a zero tolerance it doesn't even say that if you bring a gun that you can be put out for a whole year um you know, again, there there can be no no zero tolerance if this and that. And I think uh, I'll, I'm one of the, the the last group. There there's always mitigating circumstances. You, you got to hear the case first before you can say guilty and give them a year. Um, there there can be you know first time offense could be mitigating some. You know, there could be all these things. You can't have a rule or a policy in your district that says, if you do this, you automatically get that, and that that being out of school for you. Um, that, that's, you know, the federal government had to step in and stop people from doing that because there was a time when kids came to school, you know, I remember Dudley Flood, 
y'all don't know who Dudley is, but Dudley was a longtime school administrator in North Carolina and ended up in the Department of Public Instruction and then worked for General Assembly. I think his last job is almost but then. But as an African American who grew up in, in the very part, rural part of, of the state of North Carolina and eastern North Carolina back in, in the 1930s and 40s, Dudley would tell you they'd just find anything. Second time you went to the principal's office, they just opened the back door and off you went to the cotton fields. You were out. They just put you out. Doesn't matter what you did. We've come a long way from those times, but you know, the, the, but so you know, it's a good thing that the federal law has given us those protections. You'd think states would stop that, but no, um, they did. The federal law, the federal government had to step in in the fifties. You saw what happened in Little Rock. Um, the federal government had to send in troops to let the kids go to school. Um, we've not, you know. I don't understand this make America great, go back to a better time. I again told you I was alive in the 50s. There wasn't no picnic. And especially for people of color, there wasn't no picnic. And so that's what we're talking about here is the federal government had to step in and put some things in place to keep schools from doing bad things and states from doing bad things to kids. We're, we're not as good a people as I, that I'd hope we'd be by this late in my lifetime. I thought we were better than this. Uh, but we're not. And that's why the federal government has had to step in and, and, and prevent things like what we're talking about right here from happening. It, there's been a long history of this kind of stuff going on. Usually it was people at the other end of the economic or racial scale. But you know, that's what makes this case kind of an anomaly. But this this kind of stuff happened forever in schools where you know, you're out. You know, no recourse, no, no due process, no nothing. That's why the federal government had to step in and say, wait a minute. Uh, these people get due process in 1969. These kids get due process. You can't just throw them out on a whim or do whatever you want to. That's why Tinker versus Des Moines in 1969 is such a water, watershed landmark case for public schools. The federal government said these kids get right and we're going to enforce that. You can't just treat them any way you want to and just put them out because you don't like it or you don't like what they had to say or who they are. Um, and that that's what this case really boils down to is, is that you just can't you can't abuse kids because you want to because you're in a position of authority. Um, so yes, there are six levels of appeal that you would go through, but and everybody knows who they who that they consult with at that level of appeal. The superintendent would not talk to the school board until the superintendent brought this case before the school board and said, "This is my decision, support it or not." That at that point they would converse. Stephanie, are you able to take the next slide? I think so. Can y'all hear me? I can hear you just fine. Ah, okay. I had to switch over to my phone. Okay. So the critique slide was, I chose two pieces of that, um, the corrupted morals and power. Um, clearly the teacher had very corrupt morals in general. Um, and then to just pick the kid out like that and give him a 50 and fail him, I just find that absolutely ridiculous. Um, so clearly she needs to reevaluate the weight of the project based on the law because no one project or assignment should have the power to fail a student. Um, and then the corrupted morals part, I feel like could get very entangled when it comes to having to consider Mr. Michaels and just having to tiptoe around that. Um, obviously they have to be very careful because he is a very important person in the community and part of the school board. Um, I just feel like when he's making his decision, he can't solely base it on that. Right. Um, and then next slide, Daniel. It's and a, then profession, I picked the three, um, accountability for student academic and social success. Um, and when I thought about that, the teacher was failing Bobby, not just holding him accountable for his actions. So if, if she really, you know, was using her moral compass, if she had one, um, she would be trying to make him a better citizen and prepare him for the world, not just fail him and then say you're gonna do this again. Um, then with consider and evaluate the potential moral and legal consequences of decision-making, um, I said that the ground for potential moral and legal consequences was very high considering that Bobby's uncle is so involved with the team and the Board of Education. It's not just that his uncle is someone important in society. And then the best interest of students, their rights, responsibility, respect are the keys to making decisions that are in students' best interest. Clearly this was not in the best interest of Bobby as the student. 
he um, should have been able to do the assignment again, or, you know, like you said, do the assignment or get the zero and get the day suspended, do the assignment again. Um, but it was just a very harsh punishment for cheating on an assignment. Shana, are you with us now? She's also having some technical difficulties. Um, I'll, I'll go over this. Um, so I've been a high school social studies teacher in the past. Um, I've always taught my students to look for precedent mm -hmm. in, in relation to cases. So just looked up about any sort of plagiarism or anything else. And in 2002, out of Piper, Kansas, a high school teacher teaching biology failed 20% of her students for plagiarism. And she made that single project worth 50% of the final grade. Um, and I don't know if the school, the at the time, the state law or anything else had anything about uh, waiting grades or anything else, but the principal and superintendent wound up supporting the teacher. And this went all the way up to the school board and the school board wound up overturning the teacher's decision, reducing the project's weight to 30%. Therefore, those students wound up passing the course. Mm -hmm. so who advises? Who advises the school board? Who do they have sitting right there every time they meet? I would assume there's an attorney present. That is correct. And what did you suspect that school board attorney said to them? <laughs> you better overturn this real quick. You better overturn this. Again, you remember when your mama told you, if your friends jumped off the roof, would you jump off with them? That's exactly what the school board attorney said to them. When it got to the point where it was legal, you know, the legal part. And yes, in 2002 in Kansas, there was a state grading scale. Um, again, I was high school principal back in, in the 1990s. We had state grading scale back then. Um, standardized testing brought in state grading scales, by the way. When we got to accountability, which started in 83 with uh, basic ed plans all over the country, uh, doing state curricula, state, state uh, standard courses of study, state testing programs. Um, during that period of time in the late 80s through the mid 90s, um, all states adopted that, that adopted statewide testing, adopted statewide grading scales at the same time. They had to to accommodate state testing. It uh, wasn't that they wanted to, they had to to accommodate state testing. So in 2002, yes, I, I read this case. And so, yes, but the, you know, the, the principal and the superintendent got bullied or decided that they would go along with the teacher. But then, you know, the school board who has an attorney said, we can't take this to court. Uh, we've got, we don't have a legal leg to stand on. You know, you, you can't do that's their job is that they don't attorneys don't care about the politics or, or you know, supporting teachers or whatever. Uh, that, that's not their deal. They said, you know, that their the first thing they ask is, is if we go to court. Can we win this? Is this the hill you want to die on? Can we win this? And they just tell them, no, we can't. We can't win this. We're violating our own policy. We can't. We can't well, this win teacher this in this case wound up dying on that hill because she uh, wound up being fired or quit i don't remember which but oh, she yeah, wound up just saying I mean. i'm out yeah that's what that's what i mean now, you know teachers will double down on you and they'll get everybody that you know they're in serve or their union rep and and they'll that they'll be right there with them until you go to court and then they disappear because they know what's going to happen when you go to court uh, it's kind of like what I was, when i was typing up that critique slide about the corrupted morals that could have been such an easy way for like Tim could have just said, oh, well, since the uncle, you know, has a lot to do with it, I'll just side with the teacher, you know, or side with the with Bobby. Yeah, it just could have gotten very corrupted very fast. Sure, it could have. Absolutely. That, that's that's the notion here. Um, it, it could have gotten it, it, it really could have gotten sideways. But now uh, I think about, you know, again, in Kentucky, I'm glad. Daniel brought that up in Kentucky, the, uh, the clerk of court who refused to sell or refused to uh, issue marriage license to gay couples. And boy, she had everybody just cheering her on. You go girl, that's the way, you know, all, until she got taken to civil court and they all disappeared. And she lost everything that she owned for the rest of her life. She'll never have anything again because uh, she lost her court case. But, but everybody was cheering her on until they went to court and then they all just kind of melted into the woodworks. And, and, you know, and, it, and it's a, it, it's a, 
it's a cautionary tale for us all in that all these people that are agging us on, nobody can give you permission to break the law. If you don't learn anything else this semester, nobody can give you permission to break the law. When you go to court, it will not go like you think it will. Um, and and it, it will end very badly for you. You know, again, my job, I can't keep you out of court. My job is to make sure you win when you get it, that you haven't done something dumb that they're just going to beat you like with a stick when you get there. And, and, and they talk to you really ugly too in court, by the way. It's not like you see on TV. Um, if you, if you, when you go to court for the school system, the judge will just absolutely take all your hide off if you've done something dumb. I mean, I don't mean a little bit. Um, they'll, they'll take all your hide off. Um, so you, you got to understand that. Um, and so, but you're right. Uh, the, the school board has an attorney and and they know when uh, it's time to hold them, when to fold. Them. All on right. Our last, on our last slide, we had our final decision is that, you know, Tim can acknowledge and accept the cheating, but he and support the teacher by giving him a zero, a zero for that assignment, but it should not count as 50 percent of his grade. Right. So it's got to follow with the state law. Um Again, based on school district grading policy related to grade weights, no single assignment should be worth 50% of the final grade. And Tim needs to contact the superintendent and tell him his decision as well. Um, note that the issue as it stands is that any leader should be trustworthy and enforce the rules policy at their school, or they also may lose the support of their staff. And we discussed um, last night as we we're putting this all together and finishing up that you know, you have to be accountable to all your stakeholders. So yes. if there's any sort of issue with your policies in the school, you need to address them and you need to make sure it's, it's uh, well communicated to everybody there at the school and with the families and, and on up. <laughs> Yay. Dr. Griffin Jordan, you have anything you want to add before we go to our next group? Uh, just really quickly, just as Daniel just mentioned, um, a lot has been talked about consulting the superintendent. You need to make the superintendent um, a support for you. Uh, superintendents do not like to be blindsided. If you make a decision, and this is it's a decision that could, you know, cause some 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 things to stare up it's going to get to the superintendent anyway so um in this case if the student or the parent um decided to appeal they go to the hearing for the long-term suspension or whatever and um that hearing panel upholds your decision that you you've made um you have to give the parents an appeal form. You have to give them information on the appeal. You can't just say, well, if they don't find out about the appeal, they'll never know. We just don't say anything. You have to give them information and say, if you would like to appeal our decision, this is your next step. They fill that out. It goes to the superintendent. He's going to get it. She's going to get it anyway. Mm -hmm. So at least they know that it's coming, you know, so when it goes to them, then, you know, after that, if they, they're, they'll either support it or not. Um, and then as Dr. Lamb said, it's, it's a staircase, it's, you know, then from there it goes to the superintendent. Then after that, it goes to the board of education. Hopefully it never gets to the courts, but that would be the next step. And on the school level, um, Larissa mentioned the due process. There's a, a spot on our form, on our long-term suspension form that says, Due process was reviewed by blank. Either you, preferably the principal, or the assistant principal that's over discipline that went over due process with the family and um, made sure that the, the parents understood, okay, so this is what happened first. This is the investigation we had. This is what that whole due process where the student has a chance to, to say what they need to say. The parent has a chance. All that has to be done. And somebody has to sign off saying that the school level due process was, um, was followed. And uh, district code of conduct, you have to, whenever you give a um, potential suspension, you have to give parents a copy 
or at least ask them if they would like one. Some of them will say no, because they're mad, but you have to at least offer them um, the, a copy of the code of conduct. Um, so they'll know, they can see the district's code of conduct and they can see that you're following. And what I'll do is I'll have it and I'll have it highlighted. The uh, area that, that the violation occurred in, I'll have everything highlighted because I don't want uh, parents to think or families or the students to think that I'm just making up rules. I'm just making up your consequence. I'm just, you know, going going at it, but that I'm following and I'm fair um, in my uh, my consequences. Yeah. Now I'll thank you. Now I don't know if it's still the policy in Charlotte Mecklenburg or not because it's been a day or two since I was there. Uh, but when I was there and I was in charge of this. Uh, clear the policy was at every level, starting with the assistant principal, uh, you will give the family A, the code, the code of conduct, what they violated, and B, a notice of appeal. Again, you can appeal the, the assistant principal to the principal, the principal to the area soup, the area soup to the deputy soup, uh, or the superintendent, and then superintendent, then school board, and then you know into, into civil court. But that that we didn't make them ask for an appeal form at any level. We gave them an appeal form. Now, I'm guessing they still do that, but that's just mm -hmm. best practice. Uh, at every level, they get an appeal form. Now, now, when we talk about making sure that a kid got their due process, what we're what we're talking about there again, understand the law. We're comparing what they got, which is the procedural due process, to what the law said they were supposed to get, which is the substantive due process. When we say, did a kid get due process, what we're asking is, did the two match? Did the, the law said they got this, did they get that? And, and that's the difference between the substance of the of due process, what am I supposed to get, and procedural, what did I get? And you got to make sure that you followed every one of those little pieces all the way down the line. And if you didn't, it's going to get kicked when it gets on and when it moves on through the system and the kid's going to go back to the room. That's one of those tech, legal technicalities. And you say, well, he got off on technicality. Well, that's on you, not on him. Um, you've got to make sure that, that the two match. And that's what that's what you're trying to do is make sure the two match. But everything you do can be appealed. And even if, if somebody, just like in the, the, the case in Kentucky that, that Daniel pointed out, even if the superintendent and the principal both are nitwits and they go along with somebody breaking the law, uh, eventually that's not going to, that's not going to be uh, the school board and the school board's attorney told them, we're not going to court over this. This is stupid. This, this is a clear loser. I mean, we got no legal leg to stand on here. You better back off of this thing and you better do it quick. Um, that's exactly what the attorney said. Um, so you, you got to know that, that there's somebody going to be looking over this down, down the road. Very quickly, before we go to our next group, Joe Lynn, if your group will be getting ready, let me, let me do the screen right quick. Oh, X out of that. Uh, get here to this one. And let's see, do I have it here? Uh, to. Here we go. What we what we keep referring to, and I want to make sure that everybody understands this. It's not just district policy that you inform the superintendent when things are going to come across his or her desk. It also says right here, uh, you have to make you have to make accurate reports to the superintendent and the local board. Um, all these things right here that you have to follow. All of these. That all these certain things see right here to report certain. This is the one that that this case relies on to report certain acts of law enforcement and the superintendent. If you're going to put a kid out of school for more than a short term suspension, the law says you have to call the superintendent first. Now, if this had been an act of crime or violence, who would we have called first? We would have called law enforcement. See where it says law enforcement and the superintendent. There's a reason why it's listed in that order. If it's a violation of the, the criminal code, which means an act of crime or violence, who do you call first? The police and then the superintendent. In a case like this, when you're excluding or, or, or there's a possibility that this kid's going to be excluded for a year, like Dr. Griffin Jordan said, it's going to get to the superintendent anyway. You better call him or her first because the state law says that's your responsibility. You have to call the superintendent. That's when in the first case, that's why I said 
He didn't know what he was doing because he called the No, he followed the law. He called us because it says clearly right there, he must report back to the superintendent immediately. He didn't have to report to law enforcement because it was not an act of crime or violence. Had it been an act of crime and violence, his first calls to the police that the call superintendent. When it's only when it's only a, a situation where kids going to be excluded for more than 10 days, that's called a short term exclusion or short term suspension, excuse me, more than 10 days. You have to tell the superintendent up front by state law, not not you don't get to decide if you want to or not. So I said, because he called the superintendent was not because he was an idiot or unsure or didn't know what he was doing. He's simply following the law as it was he was required to do. Before he even started an investigation, he's required to call the superintendent first. And that's when the superintendent said, make sure you drop across your T's and dot your I's in your investigation. As, Thank you for calling me and telling me. Now, I'm, I've been informed. I'm just telling you this is politically sensitive. Make sure you follow through. And, and then he starts his investigation. You don't start your investigation and then call the superintendent. That's not the way it works or call the police. You got to understand, you got either one or two calls to make. When you get this report, you got one or two calls to make, either police and then the superintendent or the superintendent. Before you ever question the first person or launch into any investigation, this is so important. So important that you understand what the protocol is. Um, if you get it wrong, it's about your job now. I'm just telling you, you can't get this part wrong. The law is very clear in what your action is to, to, to take. It's right there. Tells you. There's there's no debate when you go to court. When you get fired, you you appeal your suspension or your or, or your dismissal. Well, it says so right here. Well, I didn't uh, I didn't I didn't think. Well, don't don't think. You know I I, I you know I uh, you know I, I use my own dis discretion. There is no discretion. The law. There is no discretion in the law. It says what you will do. It says right there. This is the two things you will do. Gotta remember that. All right, Joe Lynn's group. So case study one, um, Sherry, Rosa, Jolene, and Elisa. So um, summary, um, student named Bobby caught plagiarizing his homework assignment. Ms. Barton, his teacher, had weighted the assignment to be more than 50% of the final grade, thus failing Bobby. At the start of the year, Bobby and his mom, mother signed um, the contract indicating that they were aware of the student handbook policy. The school maintained standards of personal honesty, cheating of any kind, and will result in a failing grade by the teacher. The superintendent explained that it's ultimately Tim, the principal's decision to handle the situation. That's the summary of the case study. And then the due process, the sub substantive. Um, does the school have the right to bring the action in the first place? Um, as it relates to Bobby, no. Uh, you know, looking at the Board of Education policy, um, it should only have been 10% of his grade and to do 50% and fail him um, was not due process. And then for the procedural, was the process fair? Um, no, in the case of Bobby, because no notice was given, he didn't have a hearing of any sort and there was no chance for an appeal. He wasn't given a, an opportunity to rectify um, his error. Okay. <clears throat> Um, so the next part is the arbitrary and capricious. Um, are the teacher's actions arbitrary and capricious? Uh, yes, they were unreasonable. They were impulsive. They were seemingly random. Um, since the homework was, should only be 10%, um, she, she certainly um, was, was um, guilty of, of being in, unreasonable in that regards. Mm -hmm. um, arbitrary grading is when a grade is assigned on a basis other than performance in the course. And um, with regards to Bobby, this one project could not be um, a reflection of his overall performance. Um, so she was also guilty of, um, of arbitrary grading as well. Uh, one of the things that we talked about um, was, you know, what does this what does this, what does the research say about academic failure and um, what would be the implications for um, failing a student like this? It's, it's long past just what would happen in the summer. Um, so failing a student um, impacts their educational and occupational trajectories across life stages for long periods of time other than just a summer, um, correlates to a much higher dropout rate 
Um, many times students who are who fail or unable to take those rigorous classes later on, um, they are unable to get into the AP, the honors, the dual credit, um, whatever it may be. So that impacts that student. Um, may result in that no pass, no play. And again, um, you know, taking a student out of that um, opportunity for athletics is, is really, um, can be detrimental to these children. Um, damages the relationship between the student um, and the parents as well. Okay, let me do um, just as a, as a uh, support of what Sherry was just talking about. If you've got a few minutes, um, California Dropout Research Project. Let me say that again. California Dropout Research Project. If you want to read about the things that Sherry was just summarizing for you there and how devastating it is to fail a kid for a year or exclude them to year, you need to read the California Dropout Research Project. Most extensive research project in the history of the United States done on what happens to kids. It's incredible. You need to read it. If you don't understand what Sherry is talking about, you need to read that thing. Um, it's just brutal what it does to kids and families. Um, it's just brutal. But that, that, that you should read that if you haven't ever read it. I'm sorry. Thank you, Sherry. Um, <clears throat> um, the other thing we, we talked about was that, um, you know, we've heard that term, the school to prison pipeline. Mm -hmm. um, and so many times that begins with the zero, pol uh, zero tolerance policies. Correct. Um, these harsh tactics on um, these extreme measures. Um, often result in, in students being pushed out of the classroom. Um, and again, that's devastating. Um, so the research is that high school dropouts are three and one half times more likely than high school graduates to be arrested and more than eight times as likely to be incarcerated. Um, so, so we just kind of talked about those long-term implications mm -hmm. for this random and unreasonable decision made by the teacher. Okay, and now to the four ethical pairs of justice, care, critique, and profession. Uh, the first one, justice, uh, the teacher was not fair in her decision. And although the school has clear rules on cheating, each event should be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, other consequences weren't considered for the student. The student could have possibly received a warning, served detention, et cetera, and redo the assignment for a modified grade or redo the assignment. I know earlier there's, you know, we were talking about the double jeopardy. Um, so one assignment we know should not fail a student for the year. Teacher disregarded the school's grading policy and created her own. Sorry, y'all. Student was not given the right to due process, which was um, all unacceptable. And also I was looking at the South Carolina laws um, and the cheating falls under um, disorderly conduct, which would be level one. Um, and so um, the teacher, the administrator and the uh, teacher would have to meet and take disciplinary action with the parent as well. Um, care, <clears throat> the teacher was not caring towards the student's situation. We know students can get overwhelmed with sports, academics, the student was wrong, but the case study did not give any indication that Bobby had a habit of cheating, so the teacher's decision was extreme. Um, the teacher did not try to converse with Bobby to reach another solution or try to offer him support with the counseling staff. Teacher did not try to make a shared decision with anyone else, um, administrator, de uh, department, or anything. She tried to use her power to do it on her own. The goal should be to learn, and it's apparent the teacher was not concerned with Event. Critique. Uh, the goal should be to fix the problem and educate the student on the error, not to inflict pain on the student. And the teacher was more concerned with inflicting pain by not allowing the student the chance to resubmit the assignment. The student also loses out on um, the actual lesson. So we have to remember, um, you know, teachers have to remember the goal here. Um, the teacher is misusing her power by attempting to fail the student without going through proper procedures. Um, profession. The teacher did not react professionally, she did not have the student's best interests at heart. Knowing the ripple effect the student would experience was not taken into consideration. 
teacher could have met with her department before making such a harsh decision. The teacher did not demonstrate good ethics. Failing him was unethical. The principal must step in and against the law. Um, the principal must step in and correct the situation because ultimately administrators are student advocates. Um, teacher, hey. must be, teacher must be reprimanded and possibly on review to see if she has a pattern of treating students unfairly. Okay, so just kind of as a reminder, we said according to the powers and duties of the principal, the principal shall have the authority to and classify pupils. The principal shall consider the pupils' classwork and grade pupil scores on standardized tests and the best educational interests of the pupils. And so we, you know, the last line we thought was the most important because at the end of the day, it is about it is about our students. So ultimately, you kind of have to the principal and the teacher, you have to decide what's your goal. Is the goal to, to make the student a better person, you know, kind of uh, help them develop 21st century skills as well. What kind of, you know, help them develop just to be a better person and learning uh, a lesson about cheating now uh, would be a, a much better a help for them in the future rather than go to college and, and have it happen again and so a some more severe consequence. Or was the goal to inflict some sort of pain to the student? And of course we know the goal should be centered around what is best for the student. So the principal's course of action, um, we, we felt like we revisited, we talked about those four ethical paradigms and said those should be kind of at the center of your decision-making. Um, and there was two kind of courses of action that the, the, was laid in the principal's lap to determine a punishment that will lead the student to the behavior, a better behavior and not commit a similar violation and determine what should happen to the teacher for violating the school's grading policy. So uh, much like everybody else has said, we said for the principal in, in regards to the student, review the district and school's grading policy first, just to make sure you have it in the forefront of your head. Review Bobby's power school records to see if there were prior incidents. Call Bobby in to talk with him and hear his perspective on what happened. Contact parents about the incident, about the incident set up a due process hearing. Allow Bobby the opportunity to redo the assignment since the purpose is to learn if this is in fact his first cheating infraction and write this up in a review 360 and assign one day ISS. So that way he is still getting the benefit of the assignment um, and kind of reaching the standards and objectives of the lesson. And then as far as the teacher goes, we said that the principal should contact human resources since this teacher violated federal and state as well as district law set up a conference with the teacher, write her up and place the warning in her file, place her on an action plan, which includes reviewing her power school grades periodically and checking in with her frequently and be clear that if it happens again, she will be dismissed. Um, and we also thought it'd be a, a good idea to review the grading policy with all teachers and possibly send out a grading policy reminder at the beginning of each nine weeks. Um, so that's kind of where we left it. All right, okay. Sherry, thank you so much for your impassioned plea for children tonight. Uh, Sherry, much more eloquent than I've been. You've heard me say a number of times, the only thing worse that this teacher could have done to this kid was physically or sexually abuse them. You just don't understand what it does to a kid and their future to do something like this to a kid. This is just heinous. Uh, that's why I couldn't have somebody like this. I'd stay, I'd fire. Uh, I, I couldn't have somebody like this that didn't care anymore for kids than that. Now, the last thing, and this is a wonderful presentation. The only thing I would say, a, a caution, and, and I'll let Dr. Griffin Jordan speak to this, and she might have a different viewpoint than me. <clears throat> One of the things that you've got to do and remember as a principal is not to punish the many for the sins of the few. What does that mean? If you have a teacher who's coming in late, don't get on the loudspeaker and rant and rave about people coming in late or put a notice in the, in the teacher's lounge. If you got a teacher coming in late, what should you do? You should talk to the teacher that's coming in late. I don't come in late. Why are you talking to me? Why am I having to hear this? Um, staff development, why am I having to step through another Marzano workshop? I'm using Marzano. Why am I having to turn my grades in? I, I, I'm following the grading policy. You got to be careful about things, about punishing the many for the sins of the few. It'd be good to review and it'd be good to do some spot checks, but I would not start punishing other teachers for this one teacher's bad behavior. You got to be careful about that. 
Um, teachers will generally go along with you, you know, if you're, you know, that, that teachers won't just turn on you because you, you punished a teacher for their bad behavior. They expect you to do that. That's part of your job is to not let teachers be rogue and, and uh, harm kids. Good teachers know that. But even good teachers don't like it when you start punishing them because some of their colleagues are not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Dr. Griffin Jordan, I'll let you have the last word before we go to our last group. That is so true. They do not want to hear it. If they're following the rules, the last thing they want to hear is you need to come in on time. You need to get your grades in power school um, weekly. They don't want to hear it. Um, and if they feel comfortable enough talking to you, they will let you know, you know, why are you telling everybody when it's just a couple of people? Um, that, of course, it happens to everybody. So my when I first started, yeah, I would say it to everybody, you know, over and over. And I got called out and I appreciate it. But now um, it's, it's a live and learn. And um, now when things are like, we have a, a, a teacher that comes in chronically late, Te other teachers who are coming in on time will, will say, you know, hey, she keeps coming in late, what's being done? And then I just reply, you know, I, I, I understand, I, I'm taking care of everything that I need to take care of and they know that I am. And you know, we just had uh, that situation and our year has ended. So did that employment with, with that one particular teacher, but they didn't know, they didn't need to know what I did all along the way all year long. But in the end, as long as they can see that you have taken proper action when need when it needs to be. You don't need to to continuously over and over again just um, tell the 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 ones that are doing right to continue doing right. Um, I did want to say one thing about the presentation. Um, Rosa mentioned that the student didn't appear to have a habit of cheating. That word is is the habit that kind of goes a long way when you're when you're. Uh, giving your consequences for different infractions, um, you have your mitigating and your aggregating, um, aggravating factors. So if it's mitigating, it's like, okay, so excellent student, uh, they've never been caught cheating before, they've tutored other students in the subject. I have found that, especially with plagiarism, after COVID, we've seen a lot. We've just We've just seen a lot. They they've missed on learning. Um, they missed out on a lot of learning. They know that the expectation is still as high as it was, and they sometimes they're getting a little nervous. If you just sit and talk to them, why did you why did you turn in this other person's work, or why did you why did you cheat? Um, you will hear some amazing stories. Sometimes it's peer pressure, and that they're comfortable enough to talk to you. They're gonna let, they're gonna tell you. Sometimes it's the parents, um, the pressure that the parents put on them. Sometimes it's, you know, they want to get into that college and just talk. They just need an outlet. Um, that mental health is, 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 uh, is very important, um, especially now. So just kind of talk to them um, and make sure that they understand that, yeah, you're going to get a consequence, but you're not going to get kicked out of school. But I do want this to be a, a live and learn because when you get to that college that you want to go to, you do this, it's, it's not just going to be a day of ISS. It's going to be a little different. Talk to them um, and make sure that they understand. And, and just to kind of go back to um, Jolene, I think you mentioned contacting HR. I, with the, the staff member that I'm referring to, I had HR on speed dial. Everything that I did and how I documented and in evaluations, everything. I was advised by my HR representative. So I was I was feeling good because and confident because I knew that it had to go to HR. That's like I said about the superintendent. If you know it's going to have to go to the next step, go ahead and talk to the next step. They know it's coming anyway. So when that non-renewal comes through, they know that all of your paperwork is on point because they help you through it. So make sure you keep uh, HR, you know, right there handy. Um, during all these types of situations. Excellent. All right, I guess our last group, that'd be Pam, be your group. Okay. 
Yes. Hold on, I'm trying to share it. Can y'all see it? Yes, we can. Thank you. All right. All right, so welcome everyone. Um, we are Zoom team number two. And I'm Treva, we have Alicia, Pam, Shannon, and Velma. Okay, principal's guide, will cheating strike out Bobby? And the case study overview. All right, basically Bobby Hansen cheated on an assignment using his older brother's paper. Um, Jane Barton, um, Bobby's teacher plans on failing Bobby for the entire year which will require him to attend summer school. Um, Irv Miller, the superintendent, advised Tim Larson, the school principal, to make the decision as it seems to fit, but be careful, okay? All right. Okay, question one. Yeah. What should the principal's course of action be what are the issues of due process, substantive and procedural and the standards of arbitrary and capricious? On this slide here, we have what the due process is. And as others said tonight, other groups say, we all know that due process was not given to Bobby. In this case, um, the teacher in words of Dr. Lamb went rogue and um, Bobby was, she did not follow policy at all. Um, grading policy or code of conduct policy. Your thoughts, what is your feedback about the case study? When our team met, we had several, we, we discussed several issues of feedback. Our next slide um, were the final analysis. Okay, so um, I believe this is my slide. <laughs> it looks like it. Okay, so Bobby, the due process was not given to Bobby. The teacher's decision was arbitrary and capricious. Um, basically, she went to the extreme with Bobby um, for his um, for what he did for plagiarizing and that was not um, supposed to be what he, you know, what was supposed to happen. Um, so it did not matter who Bobby was or he was related to, if the behavioral policy code of contact does not follow, the decision is illegal. So what the teacher did was illegal. Um, and the teacher did not follow school policy. You cannot fail a student for an entire year regarding one assignment. Um, behavioral policy or code of conduct should have been followed, which deems in school suspension for cheating. Um, I actually, I'm going to say this, but I actually dealt with this this year. Um, I had a student that decided to copy her sister's um, assignments. Um, so she was turning in the same thing her sister did because they're twins. They were in the same class. So um, yeah, so we had to meet with the principal and the parents and that was that was not fun to deal with that um, as a school counselor. So but it did give me the um, it did give me, you know, the experience to be able to say, hey, don't do this, because if you do it again, there might be different consequences. And so I myself, um, I'm at a charter school, so um, our rules might be a little different and we're online. And so, you know, a lot of a lot of cheating does happen online. So it's kind of hard to um, discipline that, but we we don't have a lot of this, but we also sometimes have to deal with it. So um, the I think that the principal should have had a conversation with the teacher 
Um, and there is, you know, about the policies, grading policies, be reminded of them, maybe put the teacher on an action plan um, or actually on a plan to, you know, say either this is going to happen or you're going to be, you could be fired um, over this. So, um, and poor Bobby, um, I, I feel for the kid. I know this is just the case, but I would have felt for the kid. And as a school counselor, I advocate for kids all the time. And I would have went, I want to, I don't want to say ballistic on the teacher, but I would have been very vocal with this teacher as a school counselor, because you don't do this to my kids. Okay, so I'm done. Shannon. We can't hear you, Shannon. Can't hear you, Shannon. Sorry. So question number two, address the four ethical paradigms as they relate to this case. So the first paradigm would be justice. Um, fairness, equality, and justice. Um, standard, it, was it reasonable? Suspicion versus probable cause, arbitrary and, and capricious. Corporal punishment is legal. Jim Crow, metal detectors are legal. So with Bobby's case, uh, Bobby was not treated fairly in his right to due process. The teacher implement, implemented her own rules and consequences, and basically she abused her power in this situation um, and what was done was illegal to the student. The next one would be care. Okay, um, care loyal and trustworthy, nurtured and encouraged, attention and support, discipline and prodding. So we've talked about with Bobby's case, the teacher showed no support or empathy for Bobby. The teacher did not have a serious conversation with Bobby about cheating. Uh, did not and no nurturing of the infraction. Instead, the teacher tried to exert her power, making an example and not following policy. And as we've stated before tonight, we have to be advocates for the kids. And um, this teacher did not at any point have a conversation, talk to this student. And as you know, I'm an assistant principal now, but before I was thinking about this as a teacher, you know, I, I could not have imagined given this kind of consequence. And, you know, I did have kids that I that I found that had cheated and, and done different things like that. And the first thing as a teacher, my thought was to have a conversation with the student, to sit down, to, to make it a learning lesson. And she she didn't try any of that. So Okay, some of the critiques um, for this was corrupted morals, power, critical theory, social class, incident slash offense type versus action type. Um, in Bobby's case, the teacher could be sued for her actions that were illegal. She used her power of being his teacher instead of following the grading system. Um, profession, accountability for students, academic and social success, model principles of self-awareness, reflective practice, transparency and ethical behavior, safeguard the values of de democracy, equity and diversity, consider and evaluate the uh, potential moral and legal consequences of decision-making, promote social justice and ensure that individual student needs inform all aspects of schooling, best interests of students is their rights, their responsibilities, um, respect are the keys to making decisions that are in the student's best interest. In Bobby's case, the teacher in this cheat, um, the teacher in this cheating incident did not model reflective practice at all. Instead of taking an opportunity to correct Bobby's behavior, she belittled the profession by making an immoral decision and demanding student rights. And also she violated, as we talked um, tonight, the federal law of zero um, policy. All right. Any questions or comments? <laughs> 
Yeah, that was a, a good summary. Thank you for that. Um, mm -hmm. You're going to be put in positions like this as a principal. Um, and this one's fairly clear, fairly clear case of, you know, you, you've got the law behind you on this one. But there's going to be other cases you have that's not going to be as clear cut that the teacher has done something uh, illegal, uh, unethical, immoral, violated federal, state law, local board policy. You're going to have other times. But your, your guiding, your, your guiding principle has to be those, those, those ethical paradigms. Uh, is this the right thing? And, and Pam said something there, um, you know, how dare you do this to one of my students? Um, I, mean, I mean, just on the surface of it, that, that even if you had the, if, even if you had the law behind you, this would be, you know, th this is, you know, you, you're obviously not caring about kids. How dare you do this to one, one of our kids? That's the perspective that you've got to have as a school administrator, that these are all our kids. and We're trying to do the best we can for them. We don't operate schools for people to have jobs. I know it's tough right now and you can't find people to work and all those kinds of things, but we can't use that as an excuse to let teachers abuse kids. Uh, we got to remember that we have kids, we have schools for, for kids and for kids to learn not to provide people jobs. Um, if you if you don't understand that, this is not the business for you. You've got to be a champion for kids, not for teachers. If you can be a champion for both, you're ahead of the game. But when it comes down to a decision between teachers and kids, you've always got to side with the kids. You've got to do what's in their best interest because that's what they're paying you for, is to, to be the champion for, for kids in, in the building. That's what school administration in the end is all about. Dr. Griffin Jordan, I'll let you close this out tonight. I told you we gave you some time the last couple of week or so uh, because tonight would be long and drawn out. We'll get a little faster and a little better. We'll go in reverse order that we went tonight next time. So the last group, uh, Renee, Shannon, and uh, Treva and Alicia, y'all will go first and we'll just reverse the order. Dr. Griffin Jordan, close this out tonight. You said it all. Um, students come first. Uh, let your teachers know that, again, you support them as long as they're supporting the students. You've got their back as long as the student's best interest is in your heart and their heart. Um, and, and go forward with that. All right. That's about as good a benediction as I've ever heard. We'll good see night. you all next week. Everybody have a good week. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Good night.